Chapter 2, Life in the Crime Scene. The rusty door led to an abandoned part of the station closed off since the early 40s. Something big was going down in Roscoe Street. Maybe that's why Alex had wanted to meet me here. Maybe not. Alright, this one's not really too heavy in storytelling or symbolism, but it is a good way to introduce us to the underworld. We were met with a rusty door that leads to an abandoned part of the station, so no longer do we use this part of the station, but still there. And this is kind of like how Max had his life before that's dead, but you know, whether or not it's still there in the past, it's still there, but it's really rusty. It's abandoned. So this part of the station does relate to his own mind, his own history. And he says something big was going down in this rusty part of the abandoned station. So everything's abandoned. He has to go into the past to find out what's going to happen for the future. And he says maybe that's why Alex had wanted me to meet him here. Because Alex probably knew something that's going to happen in this abandoned part of the station since the early 40s. But this kind of moment is a great introduction to all the homages, all the pastiche that we're going to have later on where it looks like it's from the 40s, but it's completely abandoned. And this is like a Silent Hill moment where you have like the Silent Hill city and it's all abandoned and all rusty. So this kind of moment is really great to see because... Even though it's there, it's abandoned. Nobody cares. Everyone's kind of forgotten about it. So we're going to enter into this underworld to then encounter the bank heist. One way or the other, I was going to find out. Going to a dark area. This is a thing from that comic book panel during the... You think that's bad? What the? Uh, uh. Remember the time I was in a comic book? Eh. Hey, yeah. Uh. Tell the guy that throws a grenade. Oh, Jesus. Where is he? Oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap. Where the fuck is he? Oh my goodness. Oh Jesus. I was in him so I couldn't really shoot him. <laughs> Going to the sewer. So we went from a train station to a sewer level. Hope there's no alligators. Like in Resident Evil 2. Oh, I hear voices. Yeah, spooky. But also, it's like the failure count is rising. Yeah, I wouldn't joke about it if I was you. Yeah. The station's not secured. Someone decided to play hero upstairs. That's all we need. They're complaining about Max. There's no hero. That was me. What the hell is that? The sound effect in the background went Rrr. Let pipe this. It's about time you pipe down. Is it this way? So when the guy took out his cell phone the song from Good, Bad, and the Ugly was playing as his ringtone. I didn't even know they had cell phones back in the 90s. <laughs> Wait, what was this game in? 2001? That was probably like one of those like weird black barriers. There's an Asian guy again! They all look alike. But his ringtone was Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and that is part of Pastiche. Where you have something from another work in your work. The dead end. What is that? Just darkness? I can't see goddamn shit in this game. Oh, I can't see nothing. 
I love the fog coming from the vents above me. One broken light bulb. I cannot break it. What the hell was that? Ariana Grande having a concert up there? What's going on? I know that joke's a bit dated, but it is my favorite moment from Ariana Grande. Well she got blown you up at her concert. What are you talking about? The detonator. I thought you'd bring it. You were supposed to bring it. Yeah, right. Oh, Jesus. I forgot about this part. Hey, yeah. These guys don't play nicely. The door had been welded shut ages ago and the bomb was missing a detonator. You said it wrong, Max. It's detonator. Wait, how do you say it? Detonator. Where's the detonator? What the hell? Oh, Jesus. Oh. Every time these guys say, what the hell, it always sounds like that one stupid cop guy from Harold and Kumar escape from Guantanamo Bay when he sees him escape in the plane. Okay, fellas. The police are on their way. New York's finest. They're gonna be here soon. So stick to the plan. We've got our own private exit route. In and out, do your thing. Wham, bam, thank you, bam. Oh, Jesus. I love how this gun shakes the camera. God damn it. Almost dead. Oh, Jesus. I'm limping. I got hit by a shotgun blast. Alright. I missed every goddamn shot. I see it. Had to wait for the guy to fall down. No wonder he missed me. He had his eyes closed. Use up all my pills. There should be some pills here. Heck yes. We come to you now live from the crime scene. Who is this? Right back at you. This is Deputy Chief Jim Bravora from the NYPD. You are to cease your criminal activities and surrender immediately. Sure thing, Jim. Me and the boys have been talking and everyone's real sorry. They'll never do it again. Who the hell is this? Being placed at the scene of a bank robbery wouldn't have tipped the odds in my favor. This kind of part is weird for me, but it is kind of expected from Max. Max has already shown himself to be this kind of sarcastic, sardonic, cynical kind of guy. He doesn't want to really engage with the police force because he's undercover. And because he's undercover, he kind of has to act this way. Maybe it's from his time being undercover, but he says, We come to you now live from the crime scene. We just saw people say it in the news, but he didn't know who it was, so he figured this must be a bad guy. But it's Jim Bavura of the NYPD, the chief. He's the guy in charge. He's Max's boss, pretty much. I think Max works. Yeah, Max works for Bavura, or at least the chief is Bavura. The word Bavura it means great technical skill and brilliance shown in the performance or activity, or it can also mean Something similar to Bravo, like bold. So, Bavura is supposed to be somebody who's good at his job. He's supposed to be damn good. But throughout the game, he doesn't really do much. So, I can see Bavura as a kind of sarcastic, ironic name. Because Bavura is kind of... He doesn't do much. You know, all he's doing is trying to stop Max. But you don't really encounter a police as Max. That's not until, I think, the third game you encounter the police who are corrupted in that game because it's Brazil. But in this game, the police are never your enemy. They're just kind of there 
and they're just trying, but they keep on failing. So Max tells him, yeah, me and the boys, they talked, and we said we're not going to do it again. We're sorry. So <laughs> I love that part in the beginning when I first started playing as a kid. And, uh, oh man, that red light behind him. The vault behind him in the third panel. That is great, because that's technically showing your destination. And he is right there in front of the vault, talking to the NYPD chief, and he's pretending to be one of the bad guys. And that's why he says later on, being placed at the robbery, being placed at the scene of the robbery, wouldn't have tipped the odds in his favor, because he's undercover, because he's pretending to be some kind of mafia gang member, the entire time. So if he says no, I'm innocent, or if he says no, I'm with the police, they wouldn't believe him. Because he's undercover, he doesn't have his badge in it or anything. I'm not sure. Maybe he just doesn't care about the police because they didn't really fix the issue in his life. But this kind of scene, it's funny. It's great. It's like a total noir moment. But I wouldn't really count it as something very symbolic or representational of the whole story. It's almost like a throwaway. Noir has a lot of those where you kind of like throw away a scene just for the laughs. robbers were in the sperm bank and they're trying to steal delicious spermy wormies. The bank robber's score lay on the table. Alright, so whoever was trying to rob this vault in the bank that's attached to the train station through a sewer, they ended up getting to the Azer Corporation Bonds. So Bonds for a corporation, it's like something that grows. As the corporation grows, the bonds grow. And they're kind of personal, I think. Like, or what do you call that? Not personal, but like a small group of people can get them. So they're worth a lot of money. Worth more than dollars. Just because Azer, as a company, is worth a lot. And how he says, success story has been recently been on every channel and on the cover of every magazine. So Azer, a bit closer to heaven, the company, is all over the place. This is a great example of how gods work in relation to corporations. And not to talk too much about this already, but we're what, in the third mission? The third level? And so far we've encountered, in the third level, a mention of how corporations are technically the gods of the, what would you call it, like a cyberpunk kind of world. But this game isn't exactly cyberpunk. I wouldn't consider this cyberpunk at all. Some people might, but because there's a corporation, it could be something else. And that's why I do consider this entire game as diesel punk. Some people might be angry at me for claiming this is diesel punk, or even claiming that diesel punk exists at all. But in diesel punk, we have noir, we have German expressionism, we have uh, this like absurd world, and we have an existential crisis, which is part of noir. And also in Diesel Punk, we have Diesel Technology, and that is part of what Max is using in his gun Fu. He's using Diesel Technology in the form of semi-automatic weapons, and grenade launchers, shotguns, maybe his car. He's using all this technology that's Diesel. And also, when it comes to Diesel, the idea of Diesel is to have something from the past come into the present to create a future. So, you're using a part of the past, which is his entire idea of the past haunting him, his past of needing to get revenge. That is also a mental aspect of Diesel Punk. A lot of times, Diesel Punk has some kind of revenge. It has something from the past, whether it's personal or whether it's of the world itself. But in this case, Max's world is him in his mind. The world he's in is his mind. And when he says something about the Azer Corporation, he's talking about how there is a god of the world all over everything. It's all over his world. And that is the corporation that caused his wife to die. So this godly company, because Azer in Norse mythology is the name for the gods of the principal Pathion in Norse mythology. So, it's people like Odin, people like Frigg, Thor, Baldr. Um, they're like the main gods. And Azer also does mean the word god. But then the Azer, they were at war with the Vanir. And something to take note of is that while the Azer 
used weapons in brute force. The Vanir, the ones who were against the Aesir, they used magic. And we're going to go into what exactly kind of magic Max is going to be using to take on the Aesir. So the Aesir Corporation is going to be taken out by magic. But we're going to explain later on what we mean by dieselpunk magic in this particular world. Let's open the next door. Open the vault A, which is our destination. The bank robbers had left their tools on the table. Judging by the detonators, the crooks had bought enough explosives to send Lady Liberty into orbit. Lady Liberty into orbit. There's a pretty good uh, reference though, because he is in New York. Labor Liberty is in New York. And Lady Liberty represents the liberty of America, the idea of freedom. And he says you could, with this destructive with this destructive power, send liberty into orbit. Pretty much saying that like how war, weapons, all these things, they remove our liberty. I know how Joe Biden feels every time he tries to use the stairs. It's too tense. And I got a grenade. A car alarm. I remember the first time I blew that thing up, I waited right in front of it and I got killed. Like an idiot. Hold it! Max! Jesus, you almost gave me a heart attack! I nearly shot you! Alex, I'm glad to see you. What the hell's going on? There are more corpses here than at the city morgue! It's an armed robbery. A tunnel job straight to the Roscoe Bank vault through the old station. Look out, it's the guy from Scarface. This is, is Lupino's gig? This is Lupino's doing? Lupino's men? Really? You sure know how to pick a place? Can you get through? No, it's locked. We gotta get out of here. If it's Lupino, it's... Alex? Alex! There was nothing I could do. He was dead. I could tell by the empty, accusing stare of his eyes. I could tell by the massive amount of farts escaping from his rectum. So Alex dies. The guy he went here to meet is dead. His friend's dead. Didn't. So the guy who shot Alex was wearing a big trench coat with sunglasses. And later on we find out who that guy is. Because Max didn't see him. But we saw him. And we know exactly who he is. It's BB. BB the backstabbing bastard. Oh god, oh god, oh god. Suck the wall. I forgot about you, Sunny Jim. I am doing pretty good though. So exit Huh? Exit game. Exit game commercial? That is so blurry. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's supposed to say exit gate control, but it says, looks like it says exit game commercial. Buy a soldier. Let's leave. And here's the last view of the creators of the game. Ooh, now we're in the snow. We're escaping the underworld. Alex had kept me relatively sane for the past three years. Now I didn't know how I felt. Somehow he had stumbled upon something big and ended up stepping on Jack Lupino's toes. So while in the underworld, seeing a hint 
of what the gods are of his world and seeing the theft of their bonds. Bonds could be... It could be attributed to something similar to like how we're bonded to each other, like a sacred bond. So when the theft of the bonds is seen, it is a bit of a hint to how Max had his sacred bond stolen. But sacred bond in this case would be his marriage, stolen by a later on femme fatale. One who tries to fall in love with him and tempt him into these aesthetically pleasing ideas. Max has always been trying to be ethical the whole way through, what he believes is ethical at least. And once he started to enter the underworld, he started to see what is what is aesthetically pleasing. He sees theft, killing, destruction, blowing things up, and then he sees his friend die. Now his friend didn't die because of Max entirely. Max is a 100% victim throughout this whole entire thing. Alex dies because he stepped on the toes of what Max believes is Jack Lupino, but it wasn't Jack Lupino that he stepped on the toes of. It was somebody else who hires Max's friend Bibi, who later on reveals that he is the one who killed Alex himself, which is pretty heartless, but later on you see uh, Bibi with his big shitting grin, and you're like, God, I can't wait to kill this guy. He be he's like one of the boss battles. But Alex has kept Max sane for about three years, and now he doesn't know how he felt because now Alex is gone. Friendship, gone. The last remaining thing tethering him to humanity. The last sacred bond that somebody can create with another human. Now he has nothing. What is he supposed to feel? And that's when he goes out of the underworld to enter this new world that he wasn't in before. Before he was in the sunset, he was in this world with sun. Now it's dark, nighttime, and snowing. All he sees is death. And this is him tentatively entering the battle for Ragnarok. The end of the world. And this is his first step into it from the underworld, after seeing his friend die. And in Norse mythology, Ragnarok begins after an exceptionally long winter that allows a number of imprisoned bad guys to roam free. So Loki's sons, the beast known as the Midgar Serpent, and the giant wolf. They break free. There is a serpent and there is a wolf that break loose which leads towards Ragnarok, the end of the world. And that's when they start wrecking havoc and causing natural disasters all over the world. Who do you think is involved with Jack Lupino? Well, later on we actually do encounter a wolf and a serpent. Isn't that amazing? So it's almost as if the entire game is very closely related to Ragnarok itself. Max is now in the snow, which is related to Ragnarok, the death surrounding the world. And the first sign is the murder of the god Baldr, one of the one of the Aesirs. He's the son of Odin and Frigg. And the second sign is three uninterrupted long cold winters that will last for three years with no summer in between. So three years. Three years is how long Alex kept Max relatively sane. Three years is how long Alex has kept Max relatively sane since the death of his wife. Maybe we can't quite relate that to, you know, being Balder. Maybe the wife is not related to Balder. But Balder was supposed to be the god of light, wisdom, and courage. So once light, wisdom, and courage are killed, once they're gone, that's when Ragnarok begins. Then three years later. So perhaps Balder is there during that moment when his wife dies. But maybe Balder is the house itself or something similar. Just the life that he had before. Maybe Max is Balder himself. And now he's something else. Something like a phantom. A shadow of former Balder. So whether or not Max is Balder or his wife is Balder. Or the house or something else symbolically. We do see a similarity that light was killed three years ago and now all we've had is winter but here we have Alex dying and Alex is the second death and in the mythology Hother is the one who took the mistletoe and threw it at Baldur which killed him and Loki directed him Hothar was blind and Loki is the god of the god of mischief so something mischievous 
influenced BB. And BB is technically a bit like Hawthor because, as we saw, he was wearing sunglasses. And sunglasses is also kind of a way to explain somebody who is blind. Because it's kind of like a blind uniform. You're blinded, you're obstructed, you're not able to see the light as well through sunglasses, but we can't see his eyes at all. His eyes are just black because of the sunglasses. So, with, with that said, we can say that BB is Hawthor, killing Balder, Balder is Alex, and Loki, the one who controls BB, is the one who's the god of mischief, the one behind it. Which could be considered as Nicole Horn, who is the one uh, that's behind this whole entire thing. Maybe Jack Lupino is Loki, but we're going to have to see a little bit later on who exactly is Loki. Maybe it's both of them. But that's why the symbolism in this game is so in tune with the whole Ragnarok mythology, you can't really escape it. And it's not just in names. It's not in name only. It's not just references. It's in the story itself. We're being told the Ragnarok legend through this game Max Payne. And that's why I'm thinking... If they messed up anything in this, if they removed any aspect of something like BB or Alex, or they tried to subvert it, revert it, deconstruct it, anything, anything, anything changes in this particular regard, they're going to mess it up and they're going to completely deconstruct everything and remove everything that makes this game good. So Max Payne Remake, if they remove this aspect where Alex is killed by BB, if they change anything in that, it's an instant fail. You're removed all everything that this whole entire game built up towards. You're removed... I mean, maybe you can change it to somebody else. Maybe. But it kind of has to be somebody important in that way. It has to be a Hothar symbol. It has to be a Balder symbol. It has to be something that's been keeping the light. Maybe. They could fix it. Make it a bit better. If Alex is the one who died three years ago. Maybe Alex and the wife die at the same time. That might work. That might be a bit better. Or maybe Alex dies first and then the wife dies later. Maybe that could work. But either way, we have this wonderful idea of the light dying in Max's life. He's in this world of darkness now. If there's any light or any sunshine in the remake past the time of his wife dying, the first chapter, it's not the same thing. It's not going to hit you the same way. It's a completely different idea. And that's why I fear for the Max Payne remake. And this is the end of the third level.